Okay, today on the show, we have Avery Carl from the Short Term Shop with EXP Realty. Now, Avery was named one of Wall Street Journal's top 100 realtors and Newsweek's top 500 agents last year, 2020. She and her team at the Short Term Shop focus exclusively on vacation rentals and short term rental clients. Now, Avery herself has sold over 300 million in short term vacation rentals since 2017. An investor herself with a portfolio of over 30 properties, Avery specializes in connecting investors with short-term rentals with the highest ROI potential, and then training them to manage these short-term rentals from their smartphone from anywhere in the world. She has a book coming out this fall on Bigger Pockets. We are huge fans of Bigger Pockets and have had uh, many of their, their people on our show, but this new book is called A Short-Term Rental. So all you Bigger Pockets fans out there, keep your eyes out for that. She, uh, sorry, short term rental, long term wealth is the name of the book. She also has a podcast coming out very shortly called The Short Term Show. And we're going to be speaking uh, with her about all things uh, short term rentals and investments. Uh, visit Avery at her website, which is the short term shop.com. And Avery, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. We are uh, Avery and I got derailed because I found out her husband is a serious XM DJ and I'm a big <laughs> serious person and she also a serious DJ for rock and roll uh, channels. And so we were, we were talking rock and roll for about the last 20 minutes. So I apologize uh, if, if uh, I'm keeping Avery from her busy day, but, um, and Avery herself <laughs> is a big, a rock and roll fan as well. Oh, yes. But, but before we get into the music side of it, which we could really spend the whole rest of the episode talking about, yes. um, I would love to learn about how you got into because you yourself are a musician, but how you actually got into real estate. Sure. So uh, I got into real estate. Uh, so I was working, I, I toured in bands for a while in my early 20s. And then I was working on the business side of the music business as a marketing manager uh, in my mid 20s and um, got into real estate kind of by accident. I think a lot of people have that same story. Yeah. So my husband and I moved to Nashville a few years ago or longer than I care to admit anymore, actually in 2013 from New York. And uh, we wanted to buy a house and I didn't have my license yet at the time. Our realtor at the time was really trying to get us to buy in the super hip part of Nashville called East Nashville, because everything's appreciating so fast and people are making so much money in one year on their houses. And we didn't want any part of that. We came from Brooklyn. We're good on hipsters. Like we just wanted to go out in the country and not have to talk to anybody, not have any neighbors. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah, so we did that. We bought a house out in the country. We had a little money left over and we thought, hmm, maybe we should buy one of these and rent it out and see what happens. And uh, maybe it will have appreciated enough in 20 years that we can pay for our future children's college with it. And terrible, do not ever invest based on appreciation. That's a terrible idea. Uh, I got really lucky that mine ended up going really well. I still have it. I'm going to 1031 exchange it this year into an apartment building and it's going to be awesome. But um, we got the first rent check on that one. We thought, okay, well, this is something that we really want to make a business out of. We need some more of these things. And then we read the books and then we listened to the podcast. You should do that in the reverse of what I did. <laughs> um, and so then we started educating ourselves and figured out, oh, this is called real estate investing, what we just did. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we had like one down payment worth of capital left, uh, like single family down payment and said, okay, well, what can we buy with this that we're gonna make the most amount of money, the fastest, so that we can go buy more? And we landed on short-term rentals. And we didn't wanna do that in Nashville because Nashville's horrible for short-term rentals. It's like, you, everybody's getting their permits taken away. The regulations are ridiculous. So we're like, all right, where can we go and do this? That it's just normal for people to go rent a place that is owned by somebody and not a hotel overnight. And we're like, oh, Smoky Mountain's perfect. Uh, yeah. And that's like three hours from Nashville. So we went and bought a cabin in the Smokies. And this is kind of where my, me getting my real estate license happened. So when we went to buy a cabin in the Smokies, we knew we weren't going to put it on a local property manager. We knew we were going to do it from Nashville because Airbnb and VRBO, there's no reason to have to have a property manager anymore. So um, we bought one and we could, none of the agents in that market could really answer any of my questions that were investment related, like, you know, return on investment, managing this from Nashville. What do you do if this happens? So around that time, I got my license, uh, mainly because my husband, uh, being a New Yorker is a really bad client, especially to Southern people like myself. Uh, we don't do well with the New York thing. Um, <laughs> so I was constantly having to apologize for him. So I was just like, I'm just going to get my license and I'll do this. 
And um, so we scaled that one cabin into five in about a year and a half. Wow. And during that time, friends started being like, how much are you making on this cabin? I want to do that. Get me one. And then it became their friends. And then it became actual clients. And then it became the short-term shop. And now we have uh, offices in the Smoky Mountains, in the Panhandle of Florida. So Destin, Panama City Beach, 30A area, Gulf Shores, Alabama, and Blue Ridge, Georgia, opening up a few other offices here in the next few months as well. And uh, that's how I got into real estate. I've got 42 doors now, not all short terms. Uh, six, seven of them are short terms, uh, 12 unit apartment building, and the rest are long term um, single families and duplexes. So we've got a pretty good mix of short terms and long terms and multis and single families. So that's what I do. Wow. That, that is fascinating. <laughs> you said a lot there. Um, it's, it's funny. I was, I was thinking about the, on the short term side, my sister who lives in, in South Tampa, she has a, um, a townhome that they bought and as an investment and she short term rents that she does Airbnb or, or whatever, I think v, VRBO or Airbnb and, in in you know, and I don't know what the down payment was and, and whatever, but she basically only has to rent it out uh, six or seven days a month to cover the cover the nut, and mm -hmm. then the rest is all pure profit. And so, um, you know, and she doesn't do any of the management either, and that's on top of you know paying uh, you know the cleaners and everything else. So she has to go over there every once in a while and you know take a look at things. But but it is um, it's remarkable, and it she'll never ever get rid of that because why why should she? And, and exactly. actually, it's appreciated to the level where she might, but. But, you know, she's like, I don't know, it's, she's like, basically, it's free money at this point. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. I mean, there's a little work involved in it, but you can make, you know, short terms will make between three and sometimes up to 10 times more than a comparable long term, depending on the market and the management and such. But uh, that's why we started with those. We started our portfolio with the short terms and use all that heavy cash flow to go buy some more traditional stuff just to, sure. you know, round out the portfolio. But the, I think every real estate investing portfolio does need a few short terms in it just because they do, they are like little cash flow turbochargers to help you grow faster. Well, yeah. And let's, so our audience is predominantly realtors. Most of them are not on the investor side or rather whether they're an investor themselves or not, I don't really know because we don't get the feedback there, but they often don't work with investors. And so right. I know there's a lot of fear around that, that agents have around being knowledgeable and sort of just you know, not knowing enough to really have a, a, a better conversation uh, than somebody who is familiar with, with investments. And so there's some natural fear there. And I've always thought what a great opportunity to learn about investments so that you can have those conversations because investor clients, at least for the brokers that that I, and, and I'm sorry, in Illinois, we call everyone a broker. So right. I don't know if that's <laughs> the same way. I know Florida's agent and then broker is a different thing. But anyway, um, it just depends, I guess, where, but, but realtors, we'll just call them. Realtors tend to shy away from that saying, well, investors are tough. And, and then other people are like, no, investors are the best because they take emotion tends to not factor in as much. And they just want, you know, to look at numbers and they just want you to find them great deals. And then, you know, those can be really uh, great clients. Um, just curious to get your thoughts on working. Have, have you ever worked with traditional buyers and sellers? Or are you just exclusively working on the investor side? We exclusively work on the investor side. Early in my real estate career, I did really want to work with uh, a lot of pr primary home buyers. And I learned very quickly that that was not for me. Like with investors, it's like, all right, this, this is how much it's going to cost. This yeah. is what it's probably going to make. This is what it is. Whereas with the primary home buyers, I'm very much like I buy uh, a lot of times, not, not all the time, but I have bought several ugly duckling houses and added in that value myself by doing a little work. So my, it does not compute with me when somebody is like throwing a fit because they don't like the paint color. I cannot deal with that. I'm like, just, you know, it's like $2,500 <laughs> to fix this, just fix it. Right. Everything else is perfect. And you don't like this one thing, just fix it. Uh, right. but that's, I can't, I can't operate in that space. And uh, I actually, the very last primary home buyer that I took, so I was kind of trying to resist being investor exclusive because I felt like I was going to pigeonhole myself and not have as many clients when in fact, the opposite was true. So after my first year in real estate, I think I had done like 30 million in investor prop, like investor clients that year. And I was still like, oh, I really want some more primary buyers. I really want some more primaries. And I was helping a friend of mine's parents 
uh, buy something around Nashville. And they ran me all over hell <laughs> for weeks on end. And then eventually fired me after I just oh. had this amazing year because I did not know where to find the serial number on a $50,000 mobile home. Ah, gotcha. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> look at all this experience and all these transactions I've done. I clearly know what I'm doing and you're firing me because I don't know where to find this serial number. So I, on my way home, I was like, you know what? I'm not taking those clients anymore. I'm not taking any primary home buyer clients. I'm taking the people who value the knowledge that I have. The knowledge that I have is not where to find the serial number on a mobile home. The knowledge that I have is how to invest in short-term rentals. So we're just doing that now. This is what we're doing. It was, I think it was like two or three days after Christmas that my family was in town and they run me all over and it was cold and I was just not, I was not happy about having spent all that time. And then that happened. So I was like, we're just, we are an investment team now and that's it. I love it. I mean, it makes, it makes perfect sense, you know, and, and obviously different personalities fit different client types, but I, I want to dispel. And I always think this is really important because I want, I think we have at our firm here in Chicago, we have 750 realtors and because of the way we do commissions and fees, we attract a lot of investor, best realtors who are investors. And so I work a lot about you know, probably a third of our realtors are investors and the rest are traditional primary, you know, I work with primary, you know, home buyers and sellers. Um, but one of the biggest myths, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because maybe you, you may or may not agree with this, but one of the biggest challenges I hear from realtors that are not working with investors that are, but, but are thinking about it, they're saying, well, how do you find investors? And when I've ever talked to investors, they say, oh, finding investors is the easy part. There's, there's no shortage of investors and, and there's no shortage of capital, but finding the transaction, finding the good deal to bring to the investor is, is the challenge. I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on if that's proven true for you or if you see it a different way. Um, I, I would say that it's not difficult to find investors. And I think that is a limiting belief of a lot of real estate agents is they think, okay, if I do want to work with investors, they think investors are like this big institutional money people that they have no access to. When investors is like, I mean, if you swing a stick in a restaurant, you're going to hit 10 of them. And it doesn't necessarily mean that these people own hundreds of units worth of apartment buildings. An investor is just somebody who owns a piece of real estate that they rent out for a profit. So that is, you know, there's a lot of different levels of that. So finding the investors is not difficult. Uh, it really is just learning how to analyze a deal because it is a lot different in terms of what an investor might be looking for versus what a primary home buyer is looking for. You know, like a big yard is not as big of a deal if you're buying an investment property as, uh, you know, if you're going to live there, well, I have three dogs, so I need my, I need the space for this, but when you're, you know, it's all, when you're a primary homeowner, your, your tenant is yourself. That's one family, one person. When your people are investing, they have, you know, their potential tenant is anyone. So, uh, you don't, it, there's not, it's not a specific, it really is just learning to run the numbers and like, okay, well this property, you can probably get it for this price. And in order for it to make sense, you need to be able to rent it out for this much money a month. The market rent is this. Okay. Yes, this makes sense. It's, it's not that difficult, but I think people get intimidated by it and then just choose to stay away from it. Yeah, it makes, it, it really makes perfect sense. Um, and then the other, one of the other myths, or, or I shouldn't even call it a myth, but one of the challenges is uh, traditional realtors, not, not in, you know, realtors who work with investors or who are investors themselves often say, well, gosh, I don't even know where to find these, these deals. Right. So, okay. Yeah, I get it that I can find, I can find investors once I find the deal, but finding the deal itself, it, there's an art and science to it because traditional realtors are going to, you know, live and die with the MLS. And, and sometimes those properties, those multifamily properties, those investment properties do hit the MLS. Oftentimes they don't. So I'm just curious on, on with your own portfolio and how, and how you teach other investors, um, where are you finding most of your properties? Are you finding them on the traditional, uh, you know, MLSs or are you finding them in, through other means? So I found buyers before I found deals. And it kind of like we just mentioned, uh, the places that I focus on. So my markets are a little bit different than big Metro markets. The markets that I focus on are regional drivable vacation rental, like vacation dependent tourism, dependent markets. So 
you don't run into with real estate investing. A lot of times the investors are looking for, Oh, I want the off market deal. I want the distressed property where I can pay 80, 80 cents on the dollar of what it's worth. Um, those deals happen because those sellers are in a financial hardship at the time to where they need to sell this and they're willing to sell it at 80 cents on the dollar. That doesn't happen as much in the vacation markets because those properties are mostly owned by either investors or second homeowners. And so if what causes a property to be distressed is financial trouble with the seller, those types of properties, they're just going to list those at retail well before yeah. the trouble ever hits their door. So there's not as much like distressed off market stuff happening in the markets that we're in. It does happen. We do a, a decent amount of that, but just because a property hits the MLS, especially the way the market, the real estate market as a whole is right now, does not mean that it's not going to work for an investor. I have bought plenty of things uh, right off the MLS personally that have have been some of my best investments. So just because it hits the MLS doesn't mean that it's not a good deal. And just because it's off market doesn't mean it's a good deal. Uh, so we, most of our off market stuff now is coming from past clients who are either trading up 1031 exchanging, uh, things like that. I've also got a few, and this is kind of a niche thing to the short-term rental markets as well. I have a few developers who I have convinced and like shown my buyer list and said, Hey, I have this list of buyers. I need inventory. And they let me sell their developments to my clients only. So nobody else even has, has access to them. So I've generated some, um, some inventory that way. Uh, it, you just kind of have to get creative because right now there's no inventory anywhere. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, you have to get as creative as possible and, you know, it just network with people. I hate to use the word network because I, it sounds so douchey when people are like, let's network, Let me, let's go network with people. Just yeah. be a person, just talk to people. Uh, but, you know, you just kind of have to talk to the people that you know and, uh, and see, well, you know, like I've got a big buyer list. So anybody want to sell? I have a great buyer list. And uh, a lot of them are willing to pay more money to keep it from hitting the MLS nowadays than they are, you know, 10 years ago, it was like, oh, well, if you don't want to bother listing that, uh, let me just pay you 80 cents on the dollar and you'll be done with it. But now it's like, I will pay you more money to not list it and get it in multiple offers and give it to me. So it's like a really different time in real estate. I know it's not exactly what you asked, but my answer to that is you just kind of have to be creative. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let, let's talk, let's talk about kind of where we are right now, because with uh, low inventory seemingly across the board um, with our, our listeners and our viewers, and, and certainly in, in most major markets and even smaller markets, we're, we're dealing with that because of course, interest rates are, are low and, and a lot of buyers out there. Um, on the investor side, is, is the inventory, uh, has it been affected quite a bit as well? Oh yeah. And especially with the mass California exodus, uh, even the investment properties, I mean, everybody just comes in and swoops them up for cash. And, um, it's, it's definitely tough. I think everywhere it's, there's not one market that I can think of right now that is not hurting for inventory. Yeah. And, and so do you have to end up getting more creative then to find that inventory in these, in these times are like, I know some investors will, they'll sell in postcards or they'll try to find the owners of buildings and call them. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I'm just curious if, if those tactics have shifted in the last year or so since the, you know, the, the whole market's changed. It, they haven't really shifted so much as there's more people doing it. So I don't want to say it doesn't work as well, but it's just, you really have to do something to stand out because whereas people might've been getting one or two postcards a month, now they're getting 20. Wow. So um, for me, my biggest source of off markets is my past client book of business, because at the same time that we have all these buyers that want to buy stuff, uh, a lot of people's properties have appreciated quite a bit and it's a great time to 1031 exchange. So I've just been going back through my previous buyers and saying, Hey, you know, it's, it's a really good time to sell. Maybe you want to trade up. Do you want to buy in one of the other markets that we're in? Um, your property is probably worth this much and you paid this much. And, um, that's been my biggest, uh, generator of it. Cause we're, we do a lot of volume. So we've got a really big past client list. I know that's probably, you know, not going to work for everyone, but even on a small scale, just getting one listing out of that is worth the time Huge. of going through. Yeah. 
And as far as your, um, you know, your clients, I'm, I'm curious, how often are the investors that you work with visiting the property prior to putting in an offer or, or, or is that, does that never happen? Does it happen half the time? What percentage do they actually go physically stand in the unit or the building and take a look at it? I would say this year, like in the past 12 months, zero uh, percent. <laughs> it is all videos and sometimes we can't even get in there to video until after they're under contract because when it's a, an active vacation rental if there's a guest in there sure. nobody's allowed in so there's a lot of sight unseen like even video sight unseen offers going on and we just have to video as as soon as the guest checks out and and, and i just you know I, you that's probably music to your ears where you're not having to shuffle someone around have them worry about the aesthetic uh the all of the emotional feelings people have with with aesthetics and you know you're just basically finding deals presenting deals and then putting in offers um i know there's a lot more to it than that but at <laughs> least at least are you how much of that are you doing from your you know your phone or your computer are, are you're probably not out there racing around as much i'm guessing right you're not out there racing around as much but there is a certain expectation that has to be managed because just like not every investor is like big institutional money. Also, you know, not every investor is going to be able to completely remove their emotions from it, especially when you're buying a vacation rental. Cause these are fun. Like these you're right. buying in fun markets yeah. and you think, Oh man, I never thought for a million years that I would have a house in great beach, Florida. This is nuts. This is I'm fulfilling my childhood dream. Even though it's an investment, it's really hard not to get excited about buying something in a cool mountain market or a beach market. Uh, so there is a little bit of still managing their emotions. So that is the thing that I, is kind of hanging in the balance of, okay, you're not coming to look at it. We're taking as thorough a video as possible and everything else. But then sometimes they're still like, oh, well, I didn't realize it was going to be like this. Yeah. Uh, or I didn't realize this back. It, it, there's just kind of an always something. There's always a complaint thing, no matter how well you video. So I do kind of miss sometimes the buyers being able to see things for themselves because then it's on them to have not seen that. Uh, or, you know, it, it, sometimes it's stuff that you wouldn't think is a problem. Like, oh yeah, um, that wall is actually green, not khaki. Was that a problem? <laughs> I didn't realize green was a problem. So um, it's, there's a different set of, of things to manage, but uh, it is nice to, you know, be able to have, do it on your own schedule and not have to meet people and, and drive them around. But there's definitely one set of issues is replaced by another. So it's also one of those things too, that um, I'm curious on the properties that your investors and in, or, or you purchase, how often they were already short-term rentals that you're just, you know, continuing on that track, or were these more traditional rentals that you're converting into short-term? In the markets that I'm in, they are typically something that has already been a short-term rental, but it's just kind of changing, uh, changing avenues. So a lot of them are properties that were on traditional property management companies where, you know, they have the on-site brick and mortar property management company, and they're taking 25 to 40% of your gross. Whereas now most of our clients are self-managing remotely, uh, through utilizing technology. So it's just, yes, it's, it was already a short-term rental technically, but it's just kind of changing, uh, from the old guard to the new in a sense. And the margins are better to self-manage, of course. Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what does that add to the bottom line on average, just in general to go from traditional management, which is taking yeah 25% plus to, you know, an Airbnb model where, you know, you're, you're paying for cleaners and you're, you're doing a few small things, but, but traditionally or really it's just kind of running itself. It's got to so, add quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So the average time that it takes to manage like five properties or less remotely using Airbnb and stuff is going to be less than two hours a week. And it's not going to be yeah. all at once. It's just going to be, you know, a message here, here a message there. there. Yeah. And the average property management company takes 25% of your gross. And to give you an idea, so I own four properties that gross over a hundred thousand. And if I had those all, and that's not even all my properties, 
Uh, but if I had just those four on a property management company, somebody's making six figures to do something that I can do from my phone. And that is yeah. not a six figure gig. So um, it really stops making, I mean, I, to me, it doesn't make sense for one property, but it really doesn't make sense if you have a property that is, you know, a four bedroom and up in a lot of cases, definitely exceptions to the rule. Nobody hold me to this, but a four bedroom and up in the markets that I'm in is going to hit that hundred thousand mark typically. So that's a, that's a lot of money. That's your next down payment on like two properties. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And then what, just out of curiosity, what is, how does the wear and tear shift from, from the short term, you know, to more traditional 12 month rental clients, I, I'm assuming the wear and tear is going to be more severe, um, but it's still not so severe that it's eating into mm -hmm. much of those profits, I'm guessing. Well, actually, uh, so we have, 34 long-term units and the short term stay in much better shape because they have somebody in there cleaning them professionally several ah. times, you know, several times a week in some cases, whereas my long-terms, those tenants are in there doing, I have no idea what in the hell <laughs> they're doing for a year, two years, however long they're sure. there. So I can pretty much guarantee myself that when we have a long-term tenant move out that I'm going to have to repaint, I'm probably going to have to do new carpet, may have to do appliances. Uh, so we have seen it less wear and tear on our short terms and our long terms, just because there's people in there cleaning it every, every couple of days. I love that too. I was thinking just because it was on the vacation side, maybe people treat the the units more, mm -hmm. you know, more, uh, they're more rough on them, but, but you're probably right. It's the people that are there every day, all day for a year that are probably <laughs> the roughest, especially if there's pets and, and things of that nature. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's, that's really particularly interesting. So how, how much of what you do is when you find you know, your, your investor list, your, your sort of, we call it your client list. Um, how much of those people were investors or what, you know, prior to you working with them, they were already real estate investors or how many of them have you trained? Because I know this is, this is a very popular thing right now where mm -hmm. realtors are, are training, you know, people who are traditionally not investors that maybe they were just primary residents and maybe they started with a house hacking kind of idea where they bought mm -hmm. a three flat and they lived in one of the units and they, had that client do that. And then they said, let's do more. So I'm just curious um, if you've done a lot of that, where you've trained people how to, how to really, you know, become investors. I would say it's a little bit of both. Some people will come to us and have owned, you know, maybe two or three long terms, but we get a lot of brand new investors. And the reason for that, I think is because, you know, just a regular family who may have 75,000 bucks saved up. That's not somebody who's typically, you know, 10 years ago, would have gone and bought a piece of rental property because typically, you know, back then before Airbnb and self-management kind of came along and presented itself, uh, you're only making, you know, if they were going to buy a piece of real estate, it was going to be a long-term rental and they were, you know, you're going to make five, 600 bucks a month. Now that same 75,000 can go buy them a property, not cash, obviously in finance, of course, uh, that is going to make, you know, 25, hundred, 3000 a month. And that's a game changer. That is game changing money for anybody. So, uh, we get a lot of people who are new because traditional investments, you know, they didn't want to spend their whole nest egg to make a few hundred bucks a month, but sure. something like this, they can't, and ju just do basically exactly what I did is take all that cash flow and either go buy another one and double that or go, you know, buy more long terms or, you know, got go buy a, Ferrari, I don't know, but uh, typically you would reinvest. So we get a lot of newbies and I, those are actually my favorite because um, even though you kind of have to coach them, it's really rewarding to see somebody change their own life like that and know that you helped them do that. So uh, a lot of newbies, but we love them. And then what, what do you think, and, and again, no one has a crystal ball, but just legislation around Airbnbs or, or just, we, we've seen it happen in certain, certain markets where Airbnb is, is less accepted or, or less tolerated. Other markets embrace it. Um, are you specifically picking markets to, to that are very Airbnb friendly? Obviously vacation areas tend to be, but does that ever is that ever an ongoing concern? What if, what if the tide shifts and, and now all of a sudden, you know, the government wants to step in or, or, you know, the, the, the city wants to step in or does that happen a lot? Or have you not really experienced much of that? 
So that is the number one thing that we pay attention to before we go into a new market, whether it's starting a new short-term shop office there or buying. So the reason that we're in the markets that we're in is because these are areas where people have gone and rented a privately owned property, whether it's on a property management company or not, you know, it's owned by an individual uh, on an overnight basis rather than hotels. Also, there's not a lot of primary homeowners in any of the markets that we're in. Everything, there's not a lot of industry, not a lot of jobs. Everything is tourism dependent. So these are areas where because short-term rentals have been a thing for decades and decades, like sure. well before the internet, the municipalities figured out how to monetize it and regulate that a long time ago. So these, they have regulations, but they've just been there for so long that it's not a concern. It's not a fight. Whereas in the big Metro markets like Nashville, for example, short-term rentals rather than hotels is kind of a new thing as of the past 10 years. And there is a lot of industry. There are a lot of job opportunities outside of tourism, a lot of primary homeowners in a Metro market like that, where they don't want you coming and opening up a mini hotel next to their house. So sure. that's why we focus on the vacation I call them mature vacation rental markets because that battle has been fought and they, the cities are now so dependent on the income from right. that. They, they need yeah. it. Yeah. They need it. So, uh, we, that's a big one with us. We make sure like, I will not, I know there are tons of people that make tons of money, uh, on Airbnbs and Metro markets. I won't do it because that's, it's too volatile for me. I want the tried and true vacation market where people have been coming and renting beach houses or, or cabins forever. And there's very few people who actually live there to have a problem with that. Sure. That's what we stick to. Boy, that is such a smart approach. And <laughs> to you, I'm sure that's just a natural thought, but I'm, I'm guessing for a lot of our listeners and, and viewers that that is something that, that they wouldn't have thought of. And and, and it's inter interesting too. I always think that realtors would do themselves a huge favor if they're not uh, working with investors. Either you really have two paths. I, well, there's three paths. One is to just say, I never talk to investors. I don't want to deal with it. And I can't help you. The, and the second path is I'm going to learn. I'm going to spend a couple of years. I'm going to subscribe to Bigger Pockets. I'm going to you know read the books and, and, and listen to the podcasts and really understand uh, real estate investing, long long term investing or short term investing. And then the third the third category, which maybe is is even uh, one of the smarter ways to go for agents that this isn't really their day to day thing is partner with somebody like Avery. And when when one of your clients is wanting to is vacationing down in those areas, say, hey, by the way, I know a realtor who does this. Uh, and, you know, you guys may want to consider some investment opportunities. I mean, do you get a lot of referrals from other realtors? I'm guessing you would, uh, because it, what you know is so specialized. And also, everyone vacations, right? So you know, probably just, it's, it's really a quite a brilliant strategy. If it was, I'm assuming you probably get a lot of phone calls from other realtors. Oh yeah, we do for sure. Yeah. So is that, a, is that an important part of is like networking and keeping those relationships going so that when they have clients, they uh, introduce them to you? Yeah. And I mean, we have a lot of agent clients who are like, even agents who are licensed in the States in that states, we're in. Yeah. yeah. Because they're like, we could totally do this deal by ourselves, but we don't know what to do once we get the house. So we need you. So we're happy sure. to do that. And that's a big thing too, especially with investors is, um, I invest in Chattanooga. I'm licensed in Tennessee, but I don't do my own deals because I don't know Chattanooga. I'm right. very happy to pay my agent full price and not even ask for a referral fee because when the good deals in Chattanooga come up, I want him to call me first. So here yeah. you take, all that money. I don't want a referral fee, but call me first. And that works out really well. And I try to be a good client too, and not a pain in the ass. So, <laughs> well, I, hey, what do they say? Um, they say like a doctor who treats himself is, is got a, 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 a idiot for a client, right. Or an <laughs> idiot for a patient. So, um, right. so yeah, no, it, it makes sense. And, um, boy, oh, you've said so much and gosh, I, um, I'm just curious if, if I was a realtor who was looking to learn more about the short-term space, the vacation space, and and really, you know, whether it's for my own investments or so I can introduce, you know, my clients to this idea, um, you know, what what would you do if you were brand new trying to learn this? I would buy my book in September and listen to my podcast when it launches next month. 
So let's mention that her book is coming out, which is published by Bigger Pockets. And we are huge Bigger Pockets fans. Uh, it is coming in the fall and it is titled, and this, by the way, we did not set up this plug. So this is just a perfect, <laughs> uh, a perfect night. I shouldn't have pulled back the curtain, but it, it's just sounded a little too polished. Uh, but it was really a, a great, a great segue because I do want to talk about the book, uh, which is called Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. And it'll be available on Bigger Pockets. And you know, you can all also follow Avery on her website, which is the short term shop. Com and her podcast, which is launching soon, soon called the short term show. And when the podcast and the book launch, uh, we will of course promote that as well. Um, and real quickly, tell us a little bit about the book, the short term rental. I'm, I'm assuming it's a lot of what we just talked about. Yeah, yeah, it is. So it is more for the real estate investor than the agent who is working with investors, but I'm sure it will be helpful either way. Uh, I definitely do have some agent skewed, uh, perspective on a lot of it, uh, but it's basically the first half of it is teaching uh, a potential investor how to choose a market and source a deal and uh, for that will make a good short-term rental. And then the second half is teaching how to manage it remotely. I love it. And then what are, what are it? So tell us about the format of the short-term show, the podcast coming out. So it's mostly going to be interviews of successful short-term rental investors. Some of them are, I mean, it's, anybody from other agents on my team to people who invest in far away markets. I've even got somebody on there who uh, manages properties abroad, which is really interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of different types of investors, but it all kind of relates back to how sh investing in short-term rentals has shaped the rest of their portfolio. I love it. And real quickly, since you did mention international, and I should have thought to ask this earlier, do you see yourself going into international um, vacation markets? Probably not. That's just a lot to, um, a lot of stuff to have to deal with because you have to, like, I would love to buy, uh, I would love to buy some stuff like in Tulum, but then you have to also have a local partner. And then there's just like a lot of red tape. There's, there's a lot of markets to cover here before we go abroad. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I was, um, I was in, uh, Nicaragua of all places. Um, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And we met, we met a couple from Australia that was investing in, and we were just staying at this sort of surf uh, beach thing. And uh, anyway, and they were investing in this property. They were building this property on the beach and they, they were all in and they were huge Nicaragua people. They would go in every year and vacation and surf and and they were saying that the learning experience was was really was really tough. And Nicaragua is also a com a country with with a real volatile history. And and there's just you know some some political unrest that that ha surfaces every so often. And so they were nervous about about that as well. And so uh, I imagine um, you know there's there's always those fears for those international investors. But um, but I guess you know you pick your niche and uh, and you stick to it. And and you've got gosh a number of offices, a number of areas that you guys service. Uh, so if there are any agents out there that are interested in referring clients to Avery and her and the team at Short Term Shop, um, or if you're an investor yourself and you are interested in the short term space, the vacation rental space, um, you know talk to Avery and her team. Um, but Avery, what's the best way someone should reach you? Uh, right on my website uh, at theshorttermshop.com. Yeah, go over there and you can find everything um, that is everything Avery at shorttermshop.com. But one thing that we also want to tell you is go to YouTube and do a search for short term shop and hit the subscribe button because her channel, she's putting a lot of video up, a lot of video content up, um, which is also investor focused. So uh, visit her on YouTube, just uh, do a search for short term shop and she'll pop right up. But yeah, visit her website, shorttermshop.com. Listen to her podcast coming out soon called Short Term Show and buy her book coming mm -hmm. this fall, Short Term Rental, Long Term term wealth. Avery, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And on behalf of Avery and myself, to everyone who's nice enough to listen or watch, we want to thank you um, and ask you if you want to continue to help us grow to do just one thing, tell a friend, think of one other real estate professional that could benefit from hearing this great interview that we just had with Avery and send them a link to our website. That's if they're not a podcast person, they can stream every episode we've ever done right from keepingitrealpod.com. And also uh, find us on Facebook. We are at facebook.com forward slash 
slash keeping it real pod. We post every episode we've ever done there. Also, all as we're recording these episodes, we broadcast them live for early adopters. And on behalf of the audience and myself, once again, we thank Avery for her time. She's awesome. She's amazing. And uh, we'll talk rock and roll next time because that's uh, <laughs> that's what Avery and I are, are, are very passionate about. Uh, but for now, we'll stay with uh, short-term rentals and uh, vacation properties. Avery, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see everyone on the next episode. Thank you so much.